because I really feel if they have to go back into QE again and another rescue package of multiple trillion dollars, which I'm quite sure both parties will agree to in response, ex post the next crash, you will lose complete faith in the government. I mean, we're losing faith, faith in the military, losing faith in the treasury market, losing faith in the currency. All those things are happening at the same time. And um, you'll see interest rates spike dramatically, in my opinion, once that stagflation regime comes into force. This week's specials with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. Type 2 American Silver Eagles for only $7.75 over spot. And 2 ounce mother and baby platypus coins from the Perth Mint for only $3.75 over spot per ounce. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're glad to have this returning guest. Michael Pento is the founder of Pento Portfolio Strategies. He's joining us this Thursday, October 7th, 2021. Michael, thank you for coming back on Liberty and Finance. I always enjoy being on with you, Dunnigan. Thank you. Our viewers are always asking me, when are we going to have Michael back on? So that's why I'm grateful when, you, when we can. Uh, you give us a very data-driven perspective. You watch so many forward-looking uh, indicators of where we're going that most of us uh, are just struggling to try to keep up with what you're describing, let alone understand how we could assimilate that kind of understanding. So you're helping us, uh, so, so-called in the cheap seats, to understand in a much deeper way uh, some of these tide shifts that are going on in the world around us. It can be bewildering. Uh, recently, so many things have happened to us in the past two years that nobody would have believed if you'd have told them two years ago that this was going to happen, that was going to happen. I just saw an article today uh, in the Epic Times that Los Angeles has announced, uh, the Los Angeles City Council just passed like a 10 to 2 vote, uh, sweeping uh, lockdown measures uh, where people will not be able to enter basically almost any establishment except maybe a pharmacy or a clinic uh, without proof of uh, vaccination and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of measures that are restricting people's freedom of movement, freedom of speech. Uh, uh, and now this uh, new infrastructure bill going to be containing perhaps uh, requirements on banks to report every single transaction of $600 or more to the IRS. It's just, you know, uh, guilty until proven innocent seems to be the new the new mantra rather than the land of the free and the brave. So we wanted to get you to weigh in since you've cautioned us several times in the past few quarters about an upcoming shift that you're seeing uh, affecting uh, inflation versus deflation and uh, also sectoral rotation that you would be recommending at some point uh, to different asset classes so that people can benefit from what's going on, not necessarily fight the Fed, but get ready to protect yourself when the time comes. And uh, so if you could first give us an update on your macro picture of this timeline uh, that you've been seeing develop, but you're looking at it from a data forward indicator trend basis that you'll translate into common language for people like me to understand good opening questions <laughs> well first of all i'm glad you mentioned that uh, you know la is locking down and telling people they have to have vaccine passports because that sort of explains why everybody in the world is moving to florida yeah 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 fleeing new york and yeah yeah so that explains that and then you also touched on the blockchain uh, a little bit i think uh, tangentially at least you alluded to it. Well, I mean, they're going to report every transaction that's over six hundred dollars. Well, that's you know that's the inexorable trend that we're seeing. We are going to go to a Fed coin in the near future. The Fed's put out white papers on it. They're dying to get there. This way, they can track every single transaction, not just every six hundred dollars or higher. Every single transaction, and of course, the most important thing they will be able to do is they'll be able to control completely the money supply. An interest rate dynamic spectrum. So, in other words, if they wanted to lower interest rates, and they wanted to provide or at least um, uh, convey upon the population a negative interest rate regime, they would not have to worry about a run on the banking system. Uh, that's the thing. If we can just just zero in on that right now, because I just don't think that that people really grasp the impact to our freedom that will come from a cashless society, let alone a, the impact to our privacy that will happen from a fully tracked. But as you mentioned, not only will they be able to prevent you from taking your money out of the bank if you don't like the way it's being treated in there, but secondly, uh, 
the ability to transact, as we're just seeing, if you did make the analogy from the Los Angeles lockdowns to saying you won't be able to enter, you won't be able to enter these following long lists of basically at most all establishments, being able to transact, as you're saying, uh, you want to go make a purchase, but now you're you're beholden to or subservient to the keepers of the keys as far as whether that transaction is going to go through for you. Well, here's the sad truth, Doug. You know, the asset par- asset prices have gotten so out of whack with the underlying economy that just any you know whiff of higher interest rates or any diminution of um, quantitative easing causes them to implode. So the gravitational forces of deflation are always trying to reconcile these indifferences. They're always trying to pull asset prices down. For example, we were just talking about home prices. If you're a first-time home buyer, you've been priced out of the market. Home price to income ratios are higher today than they were at the apex in 2005. They're just unaffordable right now. And interest rates are rising, so they're becoming even more unaffordable. So there's a gravitational pull. Let's the, the market is trying to pull down the price of homes. It's trying to pull down equity prices. And it takes a continuous infusion of monetary fuel, new monetary fuel, to keep the asset prices afloat. This is part of the dynamic that I'm trying to portray for 2022, which is one of disinflation and then deflation. No, we easily we easily glaze over with, with too much detail. So if you can help keep it simple for us, yes. Listen, you're smarter than me. Here's a simple, simple fact. In the last 18 months, the Federal Reserve has counterfeited, created out of thin air, an average of $250 billion every month to inject into the banking system, to hand out to consumers, to hand out to businesses, to monetize the national debt, to keep asset bubbles afloat. But they're saying now that that's all going to come to an end by June of 2022. So the average amount of new money going into the banking system, going into the economy, is going to go from $250 billion a month to zero. That has a dramatic effect, is going to have a dramatic effect on the level of asset prices, of home prices, of commodity prices, of, 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 of equities. Now, I keep hearing people talking about the fact that tapering is not tightening. They're doing a, again, I don't want to get into the weeds, they're doing a stock analysis instead of a flow analysis. It's the flow, it's the rate of change that's all so vitally important. It's not the stock of money outside, not the the, the amount of M2 that's out there, or M3, which which has gone away, unfortunately. It's the flow, the rate of change of new money. It's going to go to zero, and it's going to have profound effects on the stock market. So let's just turn the, the clock back a little bit and to see what happened since since September. So my clients are full aware, fully aware that I raised upwards of 30% cash in the portfolio at the end of August in preparation for a very rocky September. And part of that was the debt ceiling uh, debate, which I think is going to be raised through reconciliation by the by the Democrats. They have no choice. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the U.S. can either default on its debt or it cannot. It's a binary you know, operation there. And who is going to get b- to be blamed the most is the party in charge of the Congress and the White House. OK, so they have complete control of the Senate, the con- and House of Representatives, and they have con- control of, the, of uh, the White House. So, of course, they're going to acquiesce and just throw everything through, through reconciliation. And they'll even get some infrastructure done, too to the tune of about $2 trillion, spread out over 10 years. I want to remind, and this is very important. So, so we just talked about the monetary cliff coming. The fiscal cliff is going to look something like this. So the last two years, the deficit has, has averaged $3.5 trillion, 2020, 2021, $3.5 trillion annual deficit. Now, before, every, before anybody jumps down my throat and says, well, Mr. Pento is, is a moron. He doesn't understand that you don't grow economy by deficits. I understand that. I get that. You destroy an economy by running huge deficits. But when you run up huge deficits that are monetized by the central bank, in other words, if a central bank puts you know, the printing presses on full throttle and monetizes 80% of what the government is spending, it's a, a temporary adrenaline shot to the economy. 
Of course, longer term, it's destructive because what is debt but a tax on future consumption? You have the inflation tax, which is becoming very salient now. But in the short term, it's an adrenaline shot. It boosts spending. I mean, C plus G plus I plus or minus net exports is, is the formula for GDP. And G is government expenditures. So that's a big part of GDP. Okay. It was, it's going from 30% of GDP to some number way, way be, below that, perhaps 10% of GDP. So we're going to have a fiscal cliff and a monetary cliff coming. So you're going from three and a half trillion dollar deficits to something a little bit higher than one trillion dollar deficits in 2022. I think that's wonderful news long term. But again, it's about the rate of change. Okay. I am very much concerned that we have coming in 2022, China, which is the second biggest economy on planet Earth, who's ha who has a massive fixed asset bubble, which is bursting finally. China, which helped the economy out of the Great Recession by just borrowing and spending on every commodity, every infrastructure project on the planet, they can't do that any longer because their middle class doesn't save money the way we do. They, their savings are in fixed assets, and those fixed assets are imploding. You can't fix the problem by building more buildings. <laughs> You're going to make the problem worse. So China is not going to save the global economy. What's a good way to destroy the economy, Dunnigan? Higher taxes, which are coming in 22 as part of the reconciliation package. Higher interest rates, which you have right now, and higher inflation. Now, I do think on the second derivative basis, so the rate of change, that inflation will be slowing in the fourth quarter, but it's going to go from 10% to maybe 8% or 8% to 6%, depending on who and how you measure it. But it's still, here's the point, inflation is going to be several turns higher than it was in the past decade. In fact, the past four decades. So higher taxes, higher interest rates, higher inflation, China going offline. Their fact, by the way, their factory output is actually in contraction. Let's put a number on that. Okay. They're in contraction in a manufacturing, their manufacturing sector. So China is not going to save the world. Europe's biggest customer is China. So Europe is the second biggest economy. In fact, if you look at the whole block, it's the biggest economy. Um, so you have global growth is going to be slowing dramatically as 16 of the world's central banks are either raising rates, ending QE, or have indicated a date in which they will end QE. Now, that normally would be bad news, but it's absolutely horrific news for the stock market, given the fact that we are, as a stock market, total market cap to GDP, 200% is the ratio. Two times, two full times the entire GDP of the United States. So the average is 80%. The high mortar mark before this was 140% in March of 2000, and that's just before the NASDAQ lost 80% and the S&P lost 50% of its value. So this is why I'm very, very, very cautious in 2022. This is why we raised a lot of cash. In at the end of August, we raised even more cash in September, and we'll be getting more defensive as we go through time because the way I look at things and the way my clients look at things is that principal, principal protection is paramount. Yes, we want to ride asset bubbles higher in a safe manner, in a correct manner, in the right sectors, asset classes, and style factors. But most importantly, we want to protect and profit from this grand reconciliation, which I see happening starting next year. You've led right into something that I wanted to ask you about. But before I get there, I couldn't help uh, but make an analogy. We walk our dogs around the neighborhood quite often and uh, Halloween decorations are sprouting all over our neighborhood. And oh, the new thing over the last decade or so has been these inflatables, these large inflatables, and they have a fan that's always blowing into them to keep them inflated. And what you were talking about, when you talked about the Fed tapering, and even though people say, yeah, but they're not actually withdrawing, you know, from the money supply, they're just, they're just stopping adding at the rate at which they're adding. It's like whenever the power goes out or somebody kicks the, the, the cord that's plugging into the fan that has to keep continually blowing into these things, those huge scary things just start <laughs> shriveling that's what i can see here it's a great analogy and i was thinking about another analogy too how i can make it very clear so i mean you have your savings right which is the stock of your money and then you have your income that you make every year well if you're in if, if no one touched your savings but your income went down every year 
you wouldn't feel it. You wouldn't adjust your spending, your consumption habits. It's ridiculous not to do a flow analysis and to say, say oh, well, the, the big stock of M2 isn't going anywhere. Well, that's wonderful, but you're not giving banks and consumers and businesses $250 billion a month to gamble with. Just ask Mr. Kaplan about that. Yeah, and we've just had reports uh, from various clients who are looking at significant real estate purchases, you know, large, you know, thousands of acres of ranch land or different things like that, um, large homesteads, large properties all over the country saying that things are definitely rolling over uh, the, the, the rush, the boom, the, the mania that we saw this whole year. Um, is something is dramatically shifting. This leads to my next question for you. Uh, just last week, all week and this week have been insanely busy with uh, clients desperately calling to say, you know, I, I, now it's time to make my move. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting on the sidelines and I want to get now into uh, metals. I, I'm, I, I, the thing that really hits me the most is, is not what they're saying about metals. It's about, it's about they're saying, I don't want my money in the bank right now. I don't want my money in the stock market right now. I'm getting my stuff out of my, out of my uh, 401k. I want to get it into something more stable. At the grassroots, just saying from where I sit, I'm sensing this, this uh, sort of common uh, knowledge or gut feeling that there's a huge sentiment shift at the grassroots level. And again, just getting back to you from a, you're a data guy, you watch the forward indicators, any correlation that, and a lot of what you've said makes sense so far, but, but I guess if you could help to put some numbers behind, do you think that people are just hearing a narrative and that's what they're reacting to? Or do you think people are correctly sensing uh, something in, in their gut based on what they're picking up that's causing this, this sentiment shift? I don't think it's their gut. I think they're opening up their statements. I mean, the stock market peaked in June, May and June of uh, this year. In fact, well, many sectors peaked in March. E even the, the, you know, everybody says we're having this, this runaway growth and inflation trend. Inflation, yes, and growth, no. We're slow. We're actually dramatically slowing as a globe. But look at, look at some of the sectors that are down significantly. Even like, you know, industrials haven't gone anywhere since March, really, of this year. Here's a number for you. Yes, for numbers. The average stock in the S&P 500 is down close to 15%. That's the average stock in the S&P 500. Okay. So people are just, I mean, they're seeing their statements. They, they watch their, their accounts online. They say, wait a second, something is changing now. And I guess they're listening to people like me too, who are actually explaining the dynamics of understanding what, wait a second, the, the global growth is slowing. And the Fed is tightening it, is going to be tightening into this. Most central banks around the world are tightening monetary policy into this. Really? Uh, and they also have this visceral sense that their real wages are falling. They understand that, yes, they have increases in, in wages. But when you subtract inflation, you're falling further and further behind. So you have soaring energy prices, soaring uh, you know, fixed asset prices, you have falling real wages, your stock market is no longer making big returns for you, and you're, you're concerned about 2022. It makes perfect sense to me. You zero in on one aspect of that that I think you just touched on that reminds me very much of the dot-com bubble. It also reminds me of the 2007 uh, time frame, and that is that if you watch the headline stock market indices, you do not get a accurate picture of the true full market um we had back in the day back in the dot com if you just kept your eye on you know amazon microsoft and whatever at the time dell they they were like the leaders and it reminds me of the scene from uh, braveheart where he's going to go quote unquote pick a fight with the other tr uh, uh, team and and he had this promise from all these guys that they're going to back him up all these tribal leaders are going to back him up and he goes in there and he's putting himself out there and then all of a sudden he looks behind them and there's nobody behind him and so uh, we've had the phenomenon back in the market in the time when just a few companies can pull the whole index higher and it doesn't show the true market internals that most companies are not participating in that. Uh, but as John Williams from shadowstats.com always reminds us is if you only look at the headline indicators, you might miss the actual trend. Is that what you're saying about, can you describe what's going on in the stock market right now? You said, you said it perfectly. So you only have about four stocks accounting for most of the gains the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is down about 5% from its peak in the summer, but the average stock is down somewhere around between 10 and 15%. I'm not, I didn't factor in today's action. So, but if you look out over the last few days, it's almost 15% the average stock is down. So yeah, you have just a few leaders and that's, that shows that the market is very top heavy. 
Um, and if you look beneath the surface, it's very, very weak. But here's, the, here's another point I have to make. It's, it's okay just to look at the indicators for the stock market and get frazzled. So a lot of people say, oh my gosh, what's happening with the stock market? Should I get concerned? And my model is built to let me know when to short the market too. I want to be able to, to get on board either a recession or a credit crisis. That's why I monitor the credit market so, slow, so closely. And if you notice, and this is very crucial to, 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 uh, to impart to you, the credit markets right now are still holding up fairly well. And I think that's just a factor of the fact that QE is still in you know, full throttle. We're still doing, Fed is still printing $120 billion a month just to keep the credit markets afloat. That all goes away starting, I think, in December. And they have to do it. By the way, the Federal Reserve understands that they can't do a $1.5 trillion every night in reverse repos just to take the money out of the banking system. The banks don't want all this money. They, they, you know, they earn almost nothing on it in the, the interest rate on the reverse repos. Is that reverse repo having them to sop up this money from the banks? Is that another evidence of the softening of the credit market? This was rolling over people not wanting to take out these huge mortgages anymore like they were earlier in the year? Well, it could be. That's a very good point, Donnegan. In other words, they don't want to make loans on this money. They want to just park it back. Here, here, you gave, you gave me the money, Fed. Well, here it is back. Give me my, you know, my nickel. I think they get like five basis points. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure the exact money, but it's almost nothing. It's a very, it's a very nominal figure. But that's, that could be a very good observation on your board. That's part of it. But the credit markets, so the triple C debt, LIBOR, OIS, BSBY, Ameribor, all of the things that I monitor as, monitor as part of my 20 point model all say right now that while their the spreads are no longer narrowing, so um, just to be very, very uh, succinct, a narrowing spread is indicative of a healthy credit market. A widening spread to treasuries is indicative of a market that's getting very afraid. We don't see the narrowing anymore, but we don't have the widening yet. We just have a flattening <clears throat> of, these, of these spreads. So that lets me know that maybe we're getting ready for something, and I suspect that's actually the case, for these spreads to start blowing out. And then it's all over. Then it's all, I don't care what the market's doing. When the credit markets freeze, I'm talking about the money markets, commercial paper, repo market. That's all the things that I really concentrate on. Until then, until there's a crisis there, then you're not going to have a protracted bear market. You could have a correction. We had a 5% correction. Most of the stock, like I said, most stocks are down 10 to 15%. Most, the average stock. But that's nothing compared to where they have to go. You know, if I say the average of the total market cap of equities to GDP is 80 and we're at 200, the market has to fall in half. <laughs> I mean, this is, this, is, this is something that I think between 15 and 80%, just to reconcile, getting back into balance, the, average, the, the market cap of equities to GDP. And that's assuming GDP holds up, which it will not. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, people have this visceral fear about what's going to happen. They should be if they're in this buy and hold, you know, 60-40 portfolio, 60% stocks, 40 percent bonds. When they open up their statement for September, they're going to find that, well, wait a second, my stocks went down pretty significantly. And the balance, the bond balance in the portfolio, which is, you know, bond prices are supposed to go up to offset your losses in the equities. Well, that went down too. And in some cases, even harder. So um, you're, you're getting hit on both ends of, of the spectrum here, of the, of, of, of the asset class spectrum. And if you're not with someone who has a robust model, who can actually go and raise a lot of cash and short the market when it's appropriate, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. If I can make a uh, real world analogy again, or metaphor for when you talked about the spreads widening people, most people can't relate to what that might mean. But um, it reminds me of uh, that when you're about to approach volatility, and they don't know which way it's going to go, you've got they've kind of put the guardrails out to be able to move either way and not get not get burnt. Uh, a tennis player, you see a tennis player who's waiting for the, the a really good server on the other side to hit a fast serve. They don't they're not standing there with their legs together. They've got their their legs out at a, at a stance because they're ready to move quickly in either direction. And when we've seen the same thing happen in the metals prices as well, is that premiums will expand uh, to cover the volatility because you know, the the people, whether it's the mints, whether it's the wholesalers, whether it's the retailers, everybody knows that when there's great volatility, they could get burnt. They could find themselves upside down on the trade right away. So the spreads. Go out just just the 
the bid and the ask spread move far apart, just like a tennis player's legs moving far apart because no, you don't know which way it's going to go. Correct. Yeah, you have to protect your margins, and you have to in order to protect your margins, you have to raise your price. You've talked about uh, yourself as an active money manager with the complex model that helps you to keep uh, eyes ahead, for, take care of people. Uh, some people are are privileged to know things before they even uh, anybody else knows them, uh, like insiders. Uh, you've written a little bit recently about insider trading going on. Uh, what is what are some of these indications of maybe you could say smart money or informed money uh, doing things that that uh, maybe the average person doesn't know? I don't know how smart it is. I mean, first of all, all Wall Street works on insider information. I mean, you ever notice how people say, well, the people who are who manage money say, well, look what look what they manage big money. They look what the market's telling me. Well, you are the market. Why don't you ask yourself? No, because people always know what's going to happen. So, for instance, when Robert Kaplan said in the outbreak of the pandemic that he knew that the Fed was going to come and monetize with a you know a, a you know atom bombs, hydrogen bombs thermonuclear bombs into the into the uh, banking system, just flooded with trillions upon trillions of dollars. He was actually, I would say, front running that trade by buying S&P futures. I mean, how is that legal? How is the person in charge of the printing press who knows what's going to happen, goes and then places bets on the outcome that's almost virtually guaranteed to occur? And he profited personally. And that's why he had to, in my opinion, that's why he had to resign early than he, than he, when he was going to. So it's very, you know, and here's, here's the problem. We, I have no faith in central bankers, but a lot of people do. And they have to have faith in these people to, um, to have the utmost credibility um, and, and integrity. You know, integrity. When, when no one's looking, what are you doing? Are you, are you, do you have a moral code? And instead of worrying about the economy, they took time. Two two individuals. I think it was uh, was, it, was it Kaplan. I think it was Rosengrim. I don't quote me on Rosengrim. I'm not sure. Uh, Kaplan for sure took the time to gamble for their own profit while they were counterfeiting trillions of uh, you know trillions with a T. We're absolutely beyond the beyond the pale, and people are losing faith in our central bankers. They're losing faith, faith in our government. Look at this, the, the shenanigans in D.C. I mean, we, we, we agreed to uh, underwrite the full faith and credit of U.S. Treasuries for a grand total of 30 days. Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, Janet Yellen says we're going to default on our debt on October 18th. And all we can get muster in D.C. is to agree to guarantee that full faith and credit, credit for another six weeks. I mean, so you're going to you're losing faith in treasuries. You're losing faith in the currency, uh, not just the dollar, by the way, because the U.S. dollar is actually we're along the dollar and pentaport against the euro and the pound. OK, so we're up about four percent on that. Not we're up. The, the dollar is up about four over four percent this year. But the dollar is losing a lot of ground against everything else. So when you met you measure a, a currency, you have, it's always a pair. What's the dollar doing against? Why we say against what? Against the yen, or against real estate? Against gold? So here's what's going to happen, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is that we're going to have another cataclysm by the second quarter of 2022, which is going to send the stock market into free fall, and then we're going to have on the other side of that some form of universal universal basic income in perpetuity forever. And that is where I think the market really loses full faith and credit in our currency and in our treasury market. Because the game's at that point done again. The game's over. Okay, so the emergency the the, the emergency BS cover story is over. Okay, you can't say you did it at the Nasdaq bubble and you will never do it again. You can't say you did it for the real estate bubble and you'll never do it again. You can't say you'll do it for the repo crisis in 2018 and 19 and you'll never do it again. You can't say you did it for the COVID crisis and you'll never do it again. You have jumped the shark. You have now instituted for the first time in 40 years an inflation rate that's close to double digits. And going back to massive debt monetization, money printing to buy government bonds to give to people, it will be a prima facie evidence. It will be prima facie evidence that you can never fight inflation. 
and never support your currency and never defend your treasury solvency. So it could be game over as far as stagflation is concerned later on in 22. But that's that's the story after after the great crash, which I see coming in 20 in early 20, first half. Can we zero in on one more thing that you just mentioned? And that was this um, uh, government being it, it's the loss of confidence, <laughs> loss of the government's loss of faith and confidence in itself, uh, in the bank's loss of confidence in the entire anybody else they could lend money to. So everyone sending it, sending it back home to the Fed, back to the mothership. And so on. Can we talk about how this impacts ordinary people? Because my wife and I were having this chilling conversation about a week ago or two. Uh, were you calling that the years ago when we had a home equity line of credit that we found verbiage in there that was unsettling, where it said that uh, like sh should either spouse pass away or for any other reason, frankly, that the bank decided that it wanted to call the loan. It could call the loan if if thought it thought that the that the uh, the credit worthiness or the risk posture or whatever had changed. So we're sitting there thinking, why are banks willing right now to still keep lending out for 30 years into the future at 3% or whatever interest rate to people in this in the in this environment of risk? And, and if in fact the government is losing confidence in itself, so it won't even raise the debt ceiling for more than 30 days, or if banks are losing confidence in the credit worthiness or the uh, the, the the liquidity of the credit market to where they want to send uh, funds home back to the Fed rather than lend them out, what potential are, are you seeing? Potential increased risk of mortgage uh, holders, people that are have large home mortgages or whatever, that if the banks decide, you know, we we don't think we like this risk picture anymore, we want we want to pull in, we want our equity now. Is it possible that there will see rafts of foreclosures? Uh, first of all, affecting people who may be behind on their payments, but anyway, also potentially affecting people who are even current on their payments. Well, I think the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to see stagflation break out, which means interest rates are going to go through the roof. So the bank's going to make the very easy calculation and say, hey, I understand that the government has lost complete control of inflation. So you, for, you can forget about fixed mortgages at 3% or 3.5%. They're going to go closer to double digits. And, that, and the ramifications of that on the housing market and on the equity market are profound beyond belief. Because you have this infinite duration now. People say, well, you know, there's no other alternative. You know, Tina, there's no, you know, you can't put your money in the bank. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do anything but just go out way out on the risk curve and, you know, buy triple C bonds for you know, 5%, you know, where treasuries used to be. That, that calculation goes out the window. Because I really feel if they have to go back into QE again and another rescue package of multiple trillion dollars, which I'm quite sure both parties will agree to in response, ex post the next crash. You will lose complete faith in the government. I mean, we lose, we're losing faith, faith in the military, losing faith in the treasury market, losing faith in the currency. All those things are happening at the same time. And um, you'll see interest rates spike dramatically, in my opinion, once that stagflation regime comes into floor. Do you see risk to mortgage holders that have existing mortgages on their loan on their homes that the banks could start foreclosing on mortgages just to reduce risk to the bank? If system, if the risks, if the banks start to feel that their existential risk to their own enterprise because of mortgages they've already extended this in the frothy credit cycle, uh, do you see that they could start calling in loans just to try to save their skins? Well, that's all part of what I believe would be the bail-in regime. Bail-in regime, you know, you start to get haircuts and mortgage, you know, they start recalling loans. That's only in response to runaway inflation. We're not there yet. When we get after the, so we have stag, we have form of stagflation now, we're going to have disinflation and deflation fourth quarter up into the Q2 2022. Uh, and then you're going to have runaway stagflation. And if that goes on for a, multiple years, and they have no choice but to do bail-ins. That's, you know, you're talking about a currency collapse, debt market restructuring. That's that's years down the line. But is it possible to happen? Yes, it is. Bail-ins. Bail-ins are the absolute last resort because that is epically deflationary. And that's the last thing central banks. Remember, central banks have chased this illusory 2% inflation rate for many, many, many years. It could never get to the way they measured it. It couldn't get to it. And then they finally figured out, I've been telling them for years, hey, you want to get to your, I, this is a very simple formula. It's not exactly, um, and I think they know this anyway, Doug, and it's all in it. I mean, if you want to get inflation going, just hand out trillions of dollars to the American public and have it all printed by the Fed. And, and, you know, it's, it, this is what they did. It's exactly what they did. And they had a perfect excuse to do it. 
and inflation di just didn't go to 2%. As I always have written about this extensively. I talked about it on your program. The Fed has no control, direct control over inflation. Rate. They just don't. They couldn't get to 2%, and then they got to 2%, and it wasn't just 2, it was more like 12 or 14. <laughs> so they can't control inflation. They, they can't stick the landing on inflation. So, I mean, to the idea that the Fed can just magically, you know, get us back to 2% and stick, no, no. We are going to have runaway inflation in the out years beyond 2022. And then as a response to that, you get the bail-ins because they have no other choice. They realize we have to have a currency reset, a debt jubilee, a debt default re reset. That's what's coming, but only in response to runaway intractable inflation that they realize they can't control. And if anybody doubts that, just look at the record of the Federal Reserve. When have they ever been able to provide a stable rate of inflation for multiple decades or even multiple years? They just can't do it. They're either over it or under it. And lately, like I said, they're like five times over their target. So that's why they're going to react aggressively, I believe, in 2022, tighten monetary policy, a monetary cliff into a huge global slowdown in growth. Michael, if people want to take advantage of your services that you can provide as an active money manager to help watch over and make sure they're in the right places when these convulsive things happen, how should they get a hold of you? So you could uh, email me at mpento at pentoport.com. The website is pentoport.com. Um, on the website is a midweek reality check, which I give you all of my thoughts every week, Wednesday night, and it's $49 a year. Uh, and uh, if you want to become a client and you have around $100,000 to invest, just come to us. We'll have an account for you, and I'll take good care of you. you. We clear through Charles Schwab. You see everything I do, and you can leave whenever you want. I run it like a hedge fund, but it's really an RIA. Very non-opaque, translucent RIA. We've been speaking with Michael Pento, founder of Pento Portfolio Strategies. Michael, as always, on behalf of all of our, of our viewers who and myself, thank you for joining us on Liberty and Finance. It's my pleasure, John, again. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs.